is Elizabeth Cohn. I'm a professor in SIS, the School of International Service. I've been teaching in SIS for 10 years. I've been teaching in general for 20 years. And a year and a half ago, SIS made me the SIS faculty coordinator for teaching and student learning because my passion is really teaching. And so I get to do really fun things, thinking about how our students learn and do a lot of workshops, including uh, special ones for SIS. No, that, which is why I think there are not that many SIS faculty here today. Is anyone from SIS? I don't write, oh, one from SIS. We only have one hour. In my perfect world, we'd have two for a teaching workshop. So, that, but, <coughs> so that's why I have given you a lot of the material that I, one might normally verbalize. So it's, it's material that you can go home and read. Hopefully some of you did the homework for today by reading the handout I sent yesterday so that we can then talk about it. I realized, so what I'm doing, so that's my introduction. I could say a lot more about me. You know, we all love to talk about ourselves, but that's not why you're here. Next, I'm going to discuss the learning outcomes for this workshop. Why? Because, and again, I'm doing this for you as teachers, you will be evaluated with your student evaluations at the end of the semester. Just as you're going to evaluate me in this workshop at the end of one hour. And I would, the first time I got this back, it said, oh, the presenter clearly stated the goals of the session. That's the last question. I hadn't done that. So I got just dis strongly disagreed, except for some kind people just said agree, and they were just being nice, because they liked me. You know, another lesson of the essay. <laughs> so, now I include the learning outcomes. So, if you're new to teaching, one of the things I recommend that you do is go online and look, if you haven't gotten a copy of our SETs, and look at how you're being evaluated. It's very helpful for you to then think about how you can provide that structure or information to the students. So, my goals for these, this workshop, as I said, since I only have an hour, or we only have an hour, is to give you the basics of active learning, discussing the what, what I mean by active learning, and then really how and why active learning is important, so that at the end of this workshop, you will, in a summary activity, identify for yourself way, uh, examples or ways in which you could incorporate active learning into your syllabus, even for this semester, okay? Active learning does include simulations, gaming, stuff that takes way more time to prepare than I'm going to give to my class. Uh, how many of you do simulations in your classes? Or gaming? All right. So raise your hands if you do simulations. Everybody look. Your name is? Rip Lindsay. Rip Lindsay from what school? Kogod. From Kogod. Jane Hall from SOC. Jane Hall from SOC. If you want to learn about simulations, you can talk to them. Mm -hmm. Who does gaming? I call gaming. I play some games. OK. Yeah. Your name is? Susan Agolini. Susan Agolini from? Yeah. CIS. So you can talk to Susan if you want to learn about you, how to use games in the classroom. All of the active learning exercises that I have identified for today are ones that are to complement a lecture and discussion. It's a way to provide structure and enable you to reach your learning goals or outcomes for the day in still structured ways, but in ways that require you to give up some of the control in the classroom. So the reason I, um, is, did anyone, has anyone not had a chance to look at the handout of what I mean by what, ten, the 10 exercises? Yes. You haven't had a chance. You haven't had a chance. Okay. Yes. Okay. I want, if, I'll give you one minute then <laughs> to just skim so that you know what I'm talking about when we say active learning. If you haven't read it, I, I would ask you to look specifically at Ticket Out the Door mm -hmm. and Super Sentence and even Brainstorm. Mm
just one minute. Mm -hmm. We're going to spend a bunch of time on the specific uh, 10 exercises, but before I do that, I want to talk about the importance of why active learning and some tips for being effective in, in using active learning in the classroom. But I realized uh, when I had done this workshop once before that it makes no sense to talk about the why and the how unless you really know what we're talking about. And that's why I had you look at the what first. But I know you're really interested in the, in the what. But the, the few things I would say, and all of this is on the other one, the handout that's one-sided. These are my, uh, my notes, which is just to remember, first, our student body, <laughs> Which is my next project, looking at the way in which are uh, who are these millennials and who are these students. I'll just, you know, the, the average attention span is about 12 minutes. But has, did anyone read the New Yorker article, uh, Hollywood and Vine, about it, ne December 15th, New Yorker, about vines? Does anyone know about vines? Yeah. Okay, the SOC, yeah. What is a vine? <laughs> it is a video that is entertainment. There are people on YouTube making tens of thousands of dollars with their vines. How long is a vine, the newest entertainment? Six seconds. <laughs> I, I sent this information, I sent the article to my 20 something year old nephew. He said, that's right. Sent it to my 60 year old friend. She said, Stop the world, I want to get off. <laughs> <laughs> this is the world that we're now dealing with. So that's my sort of little uh, in a nutshell. The other thing is, I think we all know this. When you hear something, you sort of get a sense of it. When you have to explain it to somebody, you really have to know it. And so, if I had more time, one of the things I would do in this workshop is show active learning, model it. I would have had you each pair up, pick one of the 10 exercises that I would have designated to you, discuss it amongst your pair, then find another pair with a different exercise. You'd have to explain it to them. And then, if after, and then they would explain their exercise to you. And then go to another pair they would explain, you would explain your exercise to them, they would explain their exercise to you. Now, the advantage of that, you would really know three exercises really well. The one you learned in your pair, the one that someone else explained to you, and the one, and the, one that, and the two others that were explained to you. But that would take about 20 minutes. That's the disadvantage of active learning, which is you get to know some things really well, but you're not, quote, covering as much information. Which is why you also have to, uh, one of the most important things about active learning is to remember that our students forget most of a lecture <laughs> by the end of the week. So the most important tip I can give to you today is to let go of the idea that lecturing is teaching. That lecturing alone is not going to actually con uh, produce the student learning that studies show um, we think. Um, we have learning outcomes very often where uh, dictated by the textbook. So when you do active learning, since you don't necessarily cover as much ground for each point, should you limit your learning outcomes to what they will actually <coughs> learn? Absolutely. If your learning outcomes are your goals, your intentions of what you plan for the students to learn. Which and so therefore, whatever uh, you can, and then, and then it is some obligation on your part to then teach them that. If you have more than you can actually teach, you don't put it down. Then you can't put it down. But here's the kicker, which is there are different ways to quote cover information, and that's where the different exercises can come in. 
So uh, you can ask students to write things in advance, right? So that you, they can write out things. I, I mean, I had students once do a glossary. They, you know, rather the textbook didn't have a glossary. I had them write the glossary. So you can have that online. You give them various terms. You don't have to cover it in class. They're covering the terms on Blackboard or on a blog that you've created, right? So there are, think creatively about ways to get the students to do the work in advance outside of the classroom, okay? Active learning is very important for assessment. And this is um, important, be especially if you have a lot of discussion. Some people consider discussion active learning. And I suppose you could make that argument. I would ask for, I, I would like a little more structure to it. But what happens when there's a discussion, you pair them up into groups, and you have them discuss a topic. You don't know everything that's been said. Something brilliant could have been said. Something wrong could have been said. So it's important to have some sort of summary exercise so that you can weed, that you can bring in and weed out information that you don't want them to learn or, want, or that you want to emphasize so that they can learn, okay? I'm gonna skip, so the other thing I would say is by way of introduction is just that active learning is very important for acknowledging different learning styles and for different types of students. There's a study that came out last fall that shows that first generation and black students increase their test scores by 6% when there's an active learning involved. Everyone in increases 3%, but black and first generation students increase 6%. So it is also, you know, we have, at least in the School of International Service, we have a lot of international students, uh, students who are called introverts, I don't fully accept that categorization. It's another workshop. <laughs> but there are ways in which if you pair people up, if you give them a chance to write in class before speaking, it allows people to gather their thoughts and then share. And it, it will even out class participation and classroom, uh, the, the classroom dynamics, okay? The last thing I'll say, and everything else is on here, on this handout. Students, if it's all discussion or if it's a lot of interactive ex, uh, work in the classroom, they might say, why am I paying $50,000 for this? You know, and this is not, you know, I'm here to hear what the professor has to teach me, not what my students have to teach. So it, I am always very transparent. The exercise we're going to do today will allow you to do this, encourage you to do this, and I walk around the room and show my, my presence. So I'm teaching. It's important that you still teach. It's a form of teaching and let students know that. So be transparent about that. Explain how it's relevant or what that exercise will entail, okay? Everything else is on the handout. I wish we had more time. Any other, uh, the why and the how that you can think of that you'd like to add? Why active learning is important and tips that you think might be helpful? Yes, your name is? Uh, Raya Kennedy from Gallaudet University. Um, I guess for the how, I, I do wonder about um, students sharing with each other, teaching each other material. Um, I guess at what point do you have another step of kind of approving what they plan to present or teach? Um, or how do you keep the, that misinformation from coming out? You know, not that we have all the answers, but there's definitely some things that are wrong or not complete. So are you thinking of like in small groups, small group discussions in the classroom? Because all my exercises are about in the classroom. Yeah, yeah, in the classroom. So small groups in the classroom. Often small groups, sometimes uh, groups or individuals who have worked on something and then come to present it in the classroom to everybody. Ah, group presentations or uh, presentations, I always require them to hand a draft into me one week, or one week or two weeks in advance and then meet with me. 
and we go through it. And they often get very demoralized because they have to rewrite the whole thing. <laughs> but I never waste time or the students' time in class. So I think that's uh, incumbent upon us to have the students meet with us, submit some draft in advance for a presentation. Absolutely. So I will even, they, the students end up sort of scripting it even. They say, here's our script. Sometimes they'll hand me the script. So, but, but I haven't fully answered your question. Sorry, that's it. Uh, there are ways, let's say you break them up into small groups. How can you ensure that what was said? Uh, How can you report it? How can you report it each group to the one that report at? Could you hear that in the back? No. Okay, can you repeat it? I just suggested that each group could give a one-minute quick report out on the, so that then people could hear it and then you could comment if there was a correction. So you have each, yes, each group report back. So what would you ask them to report back? Because if you have them meet for 10 minutes or even 20 minutes, they can't repeat everything that's said in 20 minutes. Kimberly, you want to? Well, yeah. Sorry, yeah. No, oftentimes I'll, I'll ask, the, you know, I'll put three questions on the board for them to discuss in groups, and then they, they come back together again at the whole class and we discuss those three questions. And if somebody's really off track, we're able to, you know, pull them back at that moment. I mean, I don't assure that everybody's got everything right in a small group, but we're darn straight that it's right as a whole when we're done. So, it can, yes, so by reporting back, you can find that. What else, other ways in which you can ensure that what was said in small groups is what you want them, you know, what they say and, and what you, you know, what they learn? Beneficial. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm also walking around the whole time. I'm sitting in other groups and I'm saying, ah, you know, wait, maybe you want to go in there, think about the question differently or make sure you did them in order or go back to this specific paragraph and reread the way in which the author's talking about this. So, I mean, I, I'm going to, I'm going to catch them, I think, before they go completely off the cliff. Excellent idea. And? Well, I have them uh, post. Your name, uh, please? Larry and Kirkman. From? Uh, School of Communication. I have them post uh, their answers to a set of questions online so they can, in six groups, compare their collective response to everyone else's. And then I'm able to create a synthesis. And you have them do that online during class? They do it at the end of the class, they post it. So we don't, they don't have to report out live in class, but they report out live to our discussion forum, and then they can look at how their set of answers compares to the other five groups. Another great suggestion. Um, I, I teach a large freshman class twice a week, and, and and I'm going to be in the new theater that we have in SSC. And I'm a little concerned about it because it is a theater. And I already had this in Wexler, but now it's really a problem. It's a theater. Their seats are clamped down. I do, you know, try to break them up. But how, have you had to deal with that? And is there a percentage in such a short class of how it much is time you do? It is hard. And uh, do your best is how, what how I can large say. It's 50, but they're in the 150 seat theater. So well, then I you do have you do have room to put them can, in groups I mean, in I that can place space. Them they can't. The room, yeah. They well, can't what you can that. what I would have them do is uh, I would have them meet so that you two and you two would be a group. Mm -hmm. So you turn around. Yeah. So that they yeah. they would do it that way. So it'd have a group of four. I'd also you can also have them um, when they walk in if you want them uh, to mix up to not talk with the same people. You can have you know quadrants and have them sit in. You give them numbers and, say, and let them know at the beginning of the semester that this is quadrant one, two, three, four, five, six, and today they're going to sit in quadrant one, or they're going to, so they, so you, mix it up. so you can mix it up, because it is important to have different, Do you yeah. have in mind in a class that runs about an hour and a half twice a week, how much time you're going to quote unquote lecture and how much time you're going to do other things? Great question, no. Maybe I should, but it all depends on my learning outcome and the kind of material that I have that day and the assignments, because the assignments also work with mm -hmm. what's going on. But, yeah, our student body, I, I really, to be honest, and this is my next project, as I said, which is trying to look at our current student body and what I've been doing for 20 years no longer works. I'll just say it. I can't give them some great reading 
and, and come in and say, wasn't that fantastic? Let's just talk about it. And they're like, where's the video? And they're like, 12 minutes later, they're just not there. But you know, I so yes, yeah, so the answer is it's, it's about following, um, I would say checking in with your students. I have a colleague <laughs> who asks his students, in the middle of class, he'll just say, raise your hand. How many of you are bored? <laughs> and, and he's like, okay, why are you bored? What can we do about this? That takes a lot of risk. And you have to be able to respond to it. But that's very active learning, which is asking people to take responsibility for it. So I want to um, just take, I'll take one more question, and then I want to move yeah. on to some of the exercises. Groups are important for active learning. Um, what is the optimal group size, and does, because now I find I have 35, and if I feel I must have every group be able to report out. So if it's nine groups, report out, that's a lot of time. You can't have nine groups report out. Okay. So, why would, you, let me ask, why would it not be effective learning to have nine groups report out. Repetitive, mm -hmm. probably. Paradise. Repetitive? Yes. Boring. Boring. Okay. So here's the question, which is, what do you ask them to report out? You can ask them to report out, what's one question that came up in the discussion that you really want to pursue further? Or you can ask them to report back. Sometimes I'll have groups report back by putting it up on the blackboard. Mm -hmm. Take a minute, and then I sort of you know, can look at it. It's a low-tech way, but I can look at it and say, OK, what are some of the themes we have here? It takes just a few minutes to have them write. You know, at, or I can say, I want two points from everybody, not everything that was said. You can ask them to report back What's something that was said that you think isn't quite right? And get <laughs> at that problem. But you still have 10 information. groups saying something for a minute. I would not have 10 groups report back. Then you don't have to. You can choose. I would, I would uh, have them report back to you in writing so that there's accountability. Or let's try my super sentence. If you look at the handout, yeah, the two-page handout, where is it? The That's super sentence is on page two. I use this a bit. I actually used, I guess, enough that I had a student. Uh, <laughs> she was a senior. She, I would say, uh, all right, let's do a super sentence. And she'd say, oh, goody, goody. You know? <laughs> I was like, is she becoming dependent on the super sentence? <laughs> so there's that problem, which is if you have a summary activity, it's important to not do the same thing every single time because then they, students can stop listening and just wait for you to tell them at the end what they needed to remember, right? So there's some acts here. So what's a super sentence? A super sentence. Do one right now that's really brief, I hope. A super sentence. Well, someone just explain to us what a super sentence is. It's a it's a sentence with phrases and clauses that sums up the whole class. Is that every correct? And what else? Collaboratively uh, Correct. What else? <clears throat> the big takeaway. Correct. What else? You can look at your hand now. From the class session. <laughs> Correct. And? One student starts it and then the rest has to subtract from it. And what's really important is? Consensus. Consensus. Oh, yeah. There has to be consensus on what the takeaway is. Now, how many of you knew that answer but didn't raise your hand? feels different when you're the student and not the teacher. All right, so 
Let's do a super sentence on how we can guarantee or ensure a little bit more than we um, how, how can we know that what was said in group, in small groups, is accurate? Or what we want the students to learn? We just discussed it. Let's do it. Is this a, a low? All right. So um, we can ensure, uh, I'll just say knowledge that is accurate from small groups we'd like to continue that sentence by providing feedback more specific. Um, and the instructor being involved during the process of forming the message. So what do you mean by being involved? Um, Engages in the small groups, right? Something like yeah. Engaging, being involved, for example, engaging or checking in with small groups. Checking in with small groups. Confused what feedback mechanisms mean. Is that like polling on CNN where they no longer report the news, they just tell us what we think? <laughs> Gives you an example of what our students expect from the news, which is they are part of the news. So what is feedback, Steve? What does that mean? Can can we be more specific? Well, by getting student feedback or getting student specific. Feedback mechanism, if you were talking about it, as I understand, is the, the dual prong uh, online feedback from okay. your nine groups. Such as? Such as? Online uh, reports. Uh, reports. And, and in class. In class. Uh, consensus building. Okay. Do you see how I left the space in between, the spaces in between to be able to edit? And I, and, once, and I pushed you a little bit, you, there are two ways to do this. One is you can just write what other students say and then ask, wait for somebody else to say, well, what does in, uh, faculty involvement mean? Or you can push them uh, to clarify when it's being said. Now, our students have very sensitive feelings. If you ask them to clarify, they can be hurt, right? So there's, uh, but the idea here is, and was there, is there anything that you don't think is quite right here? I, I'm going not to do quite right, but the feedback, as you were saying, is very open. It could be in the form of questions, it can be in the form of clarification, it could be in the form of giving the answers. So when you ask, 
ask that question, it basically is, so how do we provide that feedback? Right. That will actually promote active listening more than just giving the answer. Right. So there's, because feedback mechanisms is so vague that, so it's, a, it's the point where, which is, what am I trying to teach here is active learning. I want you to think specifically. So I'm going to push you. It, it's true. It's feedback mechanisms. But um, we need to be more specific. Are there any other ideas that we came up with that are important to include? Because this is what you're going to remember. Think about how does this feel to you? So are there any other, I asked a question, so you wait a moment for people to respond. Any other specifics that we came up with? I, I want us to close the loop, not for the students just to provide the feedback, but for us to clarify as a group what those takeaways will be. And the professor, yeah. the instructor, uh, confirms or disconfirms? Facilitates the confirmation. Or, and confirms points. So it's not just anything goes. There's still, you have a role here. You see how this can work? I'm thinking that we're, we forgot some things. We talked about writing, right? Have them, have them write some of this or fill out a form that you then evaluate after class. But, you know, that was one option. Online right. reports in class and written form. So it can be uh, in writing uh, to submit to prof, to, to submit at end of class. And one of those I use is ticket out the door. Okay, so I'm going to discuss ticket out the door in a second. I don't know, what did you think about doing this? What are the advantages? So we know what the advantages are, right? Well, Did anyone find it annoying? No, I, I, to me it's like I did at the end of the class a nice way to say, you know, like if you had a particular learning objective for the class, the superintendent could try to address, okay, what do you think the key concepts we learned or uh, the principle that's going forward that you could use or whatever uh, you wanted. Or, so I think tie this well, to the learning objective. There's um, yes. Now there's another way to do that, and I don't, it's not on the list. Tweetable moments. What are the three tweetable moments for class? Or that's it's another thing that faculty do, which is to say, what are the three takeaways? So it depends on what your content is for the day. It depends. So this is not paint by numbers. There's an art here, right? So I leave it up to your thinking, intelligent minds. So it depends. It, do you want the, um, the advantage of the super sentence is concepts are related to one another. If the content is, if it's really important, right, um, to have the concepts related. Maybe it's three takeaways because you dealt with different things that day. And so you want to have one of the three tweetable moments. You can ask them to tweet. I will not. Uh, does anyone ask their students to tweet during class? I've heard this from a student, a first year student who said she had a professor. I don't know if you're in the room. Who asked, they had to tweet five times during class and they had to respond to their classmates' tweets. They were paying attention to me. <laughs> That's what the girl said. She said, I was going out of my mind. Because then I got criticized because I wasn't paying attention to what was going on. She's like, because I was, and this was an, it was an intelligent girl, and she's a freshman, so she's used to all of this technology, not me, like, me, this old fart. And she was freaking out by it, and too afraid to tell the professor. Well, also, millennials aren't that into Twitter, from my experience. Yeah. If they were Facebook commenting on each other, mm -hmm. it might be a different story. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's great. I want to read Facebook. <laughs> sure. Exactly. All right. So let's, another way to do this is called Ticket Out the Door. Why don't you take a look at Ticket Out the Door?
This, I think, is a wonderful summary exercise. I just committed the cardinal sin. You do not ask a question, ask students to read something and then keep talking. You've just given them a mixed message. Or encourage them to multitask, and I don't think that helps us. I did a teaching workshop this fall, and I wanted to know, because I'd be working with those faculty again, I wanted to know, uh, I asked, I gave them a half sheet of paper, and it, it had two questions. What one technique or idea about teach, from today's teaching workshop, what one idea or technique about teaching might you incorporate in your teaching, and what one un unanswered question would you like answered? because I was going to be working with them in the future, I wanted to know what was useful today and what they wanted in the future, okay? I'm not going to do a ticket out the door today because ticket out the door is about communicating between the student and the professor, for the, right? So I use one for my first year students. Based on the participation rubric for this course, what participation grade would you give yourself for today's class? And I have them put their name on it because I give them back to them with the grade I would have given them. Because I want them to be self-reflexive. I want them to be thinking about their learning. And the, um, I'll ask, what one insight did you have from today's class? And I've gotten, you know, I never knew this, and this makes me want to da da da. Or, I, you know, my father had said, so, and so it, it goes all over the place. And then, what still puzzles you about the material we covered in class today? And then I will collect these at the end of class, read them. It's a very humbling experience where I had given this fabulous lecture on liberalism, classical liberalism, and this foundational thought of America, they had not gotten it. That's still what puzzled them to the day. So I knew exactly where to start next class. Or you can send them an email. I understand that this is still puzzling to some students. Let me go in further and explain, and you can say what you would say in class. It depends on how much time you have. So ticket out the door is a way for you to have communication with your students. What questions would you like to ask on a ticket out the door, do you think? Is there anything that comes to mind that other than what I mentioned? So, uh, what's your question? What so, strategies, strategies that you could use. Because I'm thinking of ticket out door. I have 60 students, and I don't think I can read 60 different comments and, and email them back before the next class. That strategy wouldn't work for me. So, you for can example, do I use clickers in the classroom. Yeah. And so, I get immediate feedback about yes. what people are getting and what they're not getting. So Is yeah. anyone not familiar with clickers? Raise your hand. Can you explain clickers in the class? It's just a response card. So, I have something on my computer.
it's it's, it's an amazing yeah. technology. It is. It's great specifically for that purpose, I think. And if you don't have clickers, there's also is a poll everywhere, mm -hmm. which uh, people students can use through their phones, and you can poll students directly. I use something called Top Hat that does the same thing. They Top use, Hat. They can use their phones, their laptops, their tablets, or whatever. <coughs> Okay. And it's good for large courses. So some of this stuff scales and some of it doesn't. I often teach 100 or 150 kids in a content-heavy course. So the way I use that, it's not a ticket out the door, it's a ticket in the door. I quiz at the start of every class on the content of last class material. And if 85% of them are getting it, then we can go on. And I still explain, like you said, I explain the answer. Um, but that's a way of checking in with them on a you know, a content heavy course as whether or not they got the concept or not. And then I can move on or, or not as the case may be. Okay, so I hear some concern about how many of you teach large classes? So just six or so. It, it is a challenge. Um, and the technology is definitely our friend. So clickers, top hat, pull everywhere, anyone else? You do. You can get a list of everyone's responses. You can, and I'm going this semester. I'm going to say I'm, it doesn't count. The quiz doesn't count. But I will check. And if you're getting everything wrong, because it's a way for them to know as well. If 90% of the class is getting everything right, and they're getting it wrong every single day. Maybe it's time to step up a little bit what they're doing and see me, because I might say, look, I, you know, and I use it for their participation grade. So even in my very big classes. 5% isn't what I call active attendance, so they can't just be there, they have to be there, they have to be participating, it's hard to do discussion, but. I was gonna say, count it towards their participation. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, just, I just took attendance, I didn't link that to the, whether you call it or not. Yeah. Our students are very busy, and they will triage. And so we need to set up, uh, I actually, I told my students, uh, the, I do a mid-semester evaluation. I have copies here if anyone wants a copy of it. And I, this semester I added, last semester I added, how many classes are you taking? And based on internship and, pay, and your uh, paid work, how many hours a week are you working? And I had several students, five classes, between 30 and 50 hours a week that they're working. And I forgot to ask about fraternities and sororities. And if they have sophomores, they're sophomores, they're pledging, and that's 10 hours a week. I just wanted to encourage um, faculty who are teaching the, um, the content-heavy <coughs> intro courses not to shy away from doing the active learning thing because um, you know it's not just for higher order skills; it's also for you know concept retention and, and fact retention. And, and if we take what Betsy's saying, which is that they're only paying attention for 12 minutes and they're going to forget everything we said by the end of the week, I think. It's, it's equally as important in that setting to reinforce the learning by making them more responsible for it. So I think so that's even more important. Yes. Yeah. Because they can just zone out. I can zone out. And they can I know. I can wore myself yeah. in too. But, but I do try in every class period, you know, even if it's if we're in a section that is going to be a lot of me talking at them, that I I have some exercises planned somewhere in that day. You know, at multiple points where I'm physically moving them around the room or I'm peppering them directly with questions or something that's requiring them to be on the spot instead of listening to me alone. I, I would agree. Because remember my first, uh, it was in the middle, but my main, main point, 
the main takeaway is that if you think that you're covering the material by lecturing only, you are deceiving yourself. This is, you have to really change the paradigm here and think about student learning and not teaching. And what, is, what do our students need to learn? And they need to be engaged. Before, it would be that in order to retain the material, you needed to review it within 24 hours. If you did that, then you maintain most of it, like 90%, but if you didn't review it, it just most would be gone. Is the active learning process a way of not having that required to review material within 24 hours and yet retain it? There are new studies out. Has anyone read these studies about testing? That it's not the reviewing the material, but it's the testing <coughs> material that enables students to remember. Frequent testing, I can, and I, put, I can post these to the study to Blackboard. Frequent testing leads, in, and they use these large psychology classes. And they had one that, you know, the intro psych class, and one in which the students hadn't weren't tested, they just reviewed material, and one in which they were frequently tested. And the group that was frequently tested had much higher test scores at the end. So if you're frequently testing them, and it's, it can be these little things and say, just as you do, uh, your name again is? Catherine Sibley. Kathleen? Catherine Sibley. Catherine. Uh, you know, that frequent testing, or it, you're doing it for their benefit, right? And I approach teaching that way as opposed to being punitive. It's like, I'm not here to test you, test you. It's about, I want you to learn the material. So those tests can be ungraded? They can, definitely. They can okay. be ungraded or the, uh, definitely. All right. Any, my, um, I've covered, <laughs> so to speak, most of the material that I would like to make sure that I got to today. So other questions from you? I've, other comments? Let's start with, uh, we can, I can take a few questions at once, and, or comments. You and your name? Sibel Kusimba from Anthropology. You mentioned um, that fear of one's peers, the fear of being judged. I find it's a lot, I find it difficult to make uh, constructive criticism of, you know, when students articulate the ideas, it's very hard to, you know, I've been teaching for a long time, and, and I never seem to the kind of classroom where students feel comfortable making mistakes and I'll talk about all the many times I've been wrong and all the, you know, all the, all the injuries I've experienced <laughs> as an academic and I've tried to make a classroom that is non-judgmental and, and, you know, I just find like, I think we forget that developmentally they're in a very different stage, that even culturally young people today are just different and they just um, don't want to be judged, they are under maybe more pressure. I have no idea, but I mean, it's so yes. hard to do this stuff. I the answer is yes. And <laughs> the answer is yes. I had a student who posted this brilliant comment to Blackboard at the beginning of the semester, never posted again. I said, that was brilliant. But, and I don't post on Blackboard. I just leave that as a place for them. And she said, well, I didn't do it again because no one replied and my feelings were hurt. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, my God. Okay, I had no idea. So the answer is yes. Our students are, and our students are constantly um, being told how great they are, yeah. right? This is the millennial generation where everybody gets a trophy. So what I would say to you is keep trying different things and modeling for them. And there's a way, the other thing I would say is try to take yourself out of the mix. What happens if you can create a structure where they are prepared? You have to provide the structure so that they can do well. If I give reading questions. I, I model every single class where I'm going to call on them, I'm going to ask them to give information that, about from the reading, something that they've thought about, okay? Or they're being responsible for it. You can't just go in and say, you know, I'm breaking up into small groups and I want you to know based on these three questions, if you haven't modeled that and they're like, oh, I didn't do the reading, did you do the reading? So I 
what I would just say is to keep reinforcing the positive comments. And I also tell my students, I take them seriously. This is a whole workshop I've done in class discussion. I take them seriously. I don't, I, you know, if, if um, someone else says something, I say, did you get that down? Because that was a really good point. And you need to ask her to repeat it. I don't repeat what students say because I don't want to reinforce that the only thing deserving of taking note is what comes out of my mouth. So I try to democratize the classroom more that way. What that means, I tell the students, is I have to call out if it's not quite right. And it's a sign of respect to everyone that everyone's voice is important in the classroom. And occasionally, I'll have one student who just has this problem. But usually, it evens out. So I explain, the, I guess, the philosophy of it and just reinforce their use to it. Other questions? I want to ask a little bit about discussion. You said that you sort of felt it was active learning, but that there was like a debate to be had on that. Do you think that um, discussion is another valuable way to get students to actually demonstrate that they understand the material, or do you think that, you know, like what are, what are the trade-offs? Discussion can be great if they're prepared. I, I just say, and again, I say it's democrat I democratize the classroom, so discussion has to be based on the reading, so that everybody can do well. I don't want, otherwise the student who has much more preparation, who traveled around the world with his parents, you know, since age nine, I say I'm not going to privilege that. Everybody has a chance, and I will cut students off if it's not based on the reading. So yes, I think if you create a structure uh, and expectations, participation and discussion can be very important. I have here a handout, which I always bring with me when I'm doing workshops. The best participation work uh, rubric I've ever seen by a guy from Villanova, and here's his categories. Listening, preparation, quality of contributions, impact on seminar, and what's last? Frequency. And so it's got to move the conversation forward. I put this on my syllabi, and I discuss it with my students multiple times because they're trained very badly. Last comment. I guess the question I have in regards to discussion is how do you get students who like may be prepared and like very intelligent but are more introverted and won't speak up in a class setting? Think, ink, pair, and share. Mm -hmm. It's on the handout. It's exactly for that purpose. Someone who is going to be comfortable speaking in front of 60 or 35 students is probably going to be more willing to speak with uh, the person sitting next to it. I also do something called pause to reflect or quick write. Mm -hmm. Pause to reflect is something I created myself as a takeoff on uh, responsibility to protect, which was something we discuss in the United. Responsibility to protect is a UN, United Nations concept, and uh, we discuss in it in SIS. So it's called R2P, so I made up P2R. Pause to reflect. And it's just a time for people to just write in their notebooks or on their computers if you allow them and gather their thoughts. Because most of the time, most of us are not quick thinkers on our feet. And allowing students, I find that I, I, I often do this where I'll just say, right, I'll ask a question, right. really have to give them four or five minutes and you have to time yourself. Because, you know, and, and then I'll, I might walk around and I'll say to a student who doesn't share very often, I said, that's amazing. Will you say that in class? Will you say that aloud? But I say it quietly to them. So they've given a chance to gather their thoughts I've reaffirmed for them that it's an important idea, 
and so it makes it less risky to speak. It, not everyone agrees with me. Some people say it's still putting an introvert on the spot. Um, one quick question kind of just to follow up on what both of them were talking about. Obviously, we're not approaching this from the perspective of a professor, but more so as a professor's assistant. How do we facilitate sort of higher level discussion and engagement when we're doing review sessions and things of that sort? Because we're not necessarily responsible for presenting information, but we're there sort of to reinforce the information and encourage higher level thinking. So how do we get students engaged in that? And how do we make them excited to be there and not necessarily feel like, oh, well, I already learned this from the professor, so it serves no purpose for me to be there and kind of just tune us out almost. You make it worth their while. They don't have as much of a hierarchy <laughs> in their minds because this YouTube generation, everybody is equal. So you have to make it worth <laughs> a while and ask good questions. Yeah. And that's hard. And uh, two things on that I learned at a workshop last summer, surround your questions <laughs> with silence. It's very hard. Give them a chance to think. Pair them up. You'll s what, it pair them up all the time so that they talk to each other and you walk around the room, you'll see who's done the reading or not. And then finally, if you ask a question and nobody responds, ask question so hard. Hmm. And I told that I did a workshop with PhD TAs in SIS at the beginning of the, in August. I did a, a workshop again in, in later in the semester. And one of them said, I did that thing. And they spent the entire class period then. The student said, well, I didn't understand the terminology he was using. What does he mean by this? Why is he talking about that and not this? And they got through all the content without him having to say another word. So ask, why is that question so hard? Mm. I, it's not my idea. I wish it was. It's really. Uh, we are out of time. Oh, so uh, I just want to be respectful of time. <clears throat> oh, it wasn't that important. I was just going to say in a lab, I might think about Bloom's taxonomy and only ask the kinds of questions like evaluate or let's create, or let's compare. Forget about all the, what did you remember from the lecture, but really move them on to, to a project or a, a, something we're going to create. Asking the right questions. Mm -hmm. And if you need to get at certain facts, do that in writing. Put them in pairs, do a glossary, do something like that. Yes, I will post this uh, rubric. It's John Immerwar. If you can Google it, if I, if um, but it is I M M E R W A H R. And if you just Google participation rubric, Immerwar. I M M E R. W-A-H-R, you'll get it. Thank you one and all.